I have, my dad, uh, as I've told you before, had 10 sisters, no brothers. Uh, one bathroom, no shower, <laughs> freestanding clawfoot tub, uh, one little sink, one little tiny mirror, and 10 sisters. You heard me, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was brutal. The Korean War came along, he joined the Navy out of patriotism. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, he could not wait to join the U.S. Navy. Um, but uh, my dad's uh, mom, my grandma Lily, uh, had 16 brothers and sisters. My grandpa had, uh, t he was one of 10. And they all live in the same little southern town in Kershaw, South Carolina. Uh, and I'm related to basically the town. Uh, it's why all my aunts kept telling me growing up, you need to marry someone from here, son. Like, they'd be kinfolk. No. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that kind of town. So... I have hundreds of relatives, you can imagine, because they've been there since the 1700s. So uh, of those uh, 10 sisters, I introduce you to one of my uncles, uh, Walter West, a uh, farmer, uh, uh, great man, godly man, uh, uh, well-built guy. Uh, he was like the size of his tractor. Uh, <laughs> But in uh, World War II, he was a U.S. Army infantryman, uh, and uh, he, uh, he was fighting, uh, I, I think it was Rommel in, uh, in uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, he used to, the, old, the old guys would sit around when I was a kid growing up and tell us stories about their exploits because one of my cousins fought with Patton and, and all that kind of stuff. So they were always telling us as we would ask them questions, you know, what was General Patton like and all that kind of stuff. And so we would pick their brains. And so uh, my Uncle Walter, very quiet man, um, uh, he, we were like, tell us you know, like an interesting story, you know, uh, when you were uh, in the deserts of Africa. And he said, well, he said, well, one night, uh, he said, our unit was, uh, was on a march, hundreds of us out through the desert on a road. Uh, it's pitch black, starry evening, uh, very dark. You could hardly see the guy in front of you. And as we're walking, we're just kind of talking to each other, carrying our M1s out through the desert. Uh, and he said, uh, 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 out there in the darkness, another unit came uh, toward us. Uh, we could see, you know, some of these figures and other soldiers, and they're going the direction we're coming from. So we're going to pass. And so he said, you know, the people are talking back and forth, and you could hear the other soldiers as they went by talking to each other. And he said as they went by, now bear in mind, I have to preface this by saying, and don't be offended, I mean, I have uncles, I can't understand them. Yeah. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm talking about? I don't understand what they're talking about. So growing up, I just learned that a lot of them, I just, all I ever said to them was, yes, sir. Because I never knew what they were saying. So the, the Southern drawl was very intense. Uh, and my Uncle Walter was very similar, very uh, like, much like that. And as he said, he was carrying his rifle out through the desert and these other soldiers were passing by. He heard somebody that sounded like his, I think it was his cousin, Perry. But I'm trying to remember from 50 years ago, so but I think it was Perry. So Perry uh, was walking by, and he heard his drawl in, among all those soldiers in the pitch black of the desert, and he called out as he's marching with his rifle, Hey, Perry, is that you? <laughs> Aren't you glad I don't preach like that? Uh, and, uh, and <laughs> Perry said, Yeah, Walter, is that you? <laughs> Well, they both stopped in the middle of the desert, got out of line, hugged each other, rifle ammo and all, and had a nice family reunion out there in Africa. <laughs> Unbelievable. What has that got to do with anything? I have a question. Do you think that was by accident? No. No? Christian young man out there, far from home, fighting Rommel, etc. Do you think that was by accident? No. Walter didn't think it was by accident. You mean to tell me out of all those soldiers <laughs> all over Europe, everywhere fighting, and I ran into Perry? <laughs> no. See, uh, God is concerned about that, is he not? Amen. He is. He's concerned about all those things. This is his providential care for uh, all things. He's in, in behind all those things. He arranged for two cousins to run into, run into each other in a war zone in the middle of the desert at night when all you could hear was the southern drawl. And my Uncle Walter said, no one's got a draw like that. Had to be Perry. <laughs> so, so <laughs> sorry about the Southern slang, but that is my family root upbringings. And my mom, which I, she's not here, we can talk about her. Um, <laughs> my mother's from Little Rock, and she always made fun of my dad's family being from the South. <laughs> anyway, back to my sermon. Um, <laughs> I never quite followed that. Um, how, how providential is the care of God? Uh, Hebrews 1.3 says this, quote, Jesus is upholding, present tense verbiage, uh, he is upholding the universe by his word of power. He's the primary cause, between all secondary causes. 
So what is it, if you're a scientist, that holds everything together? I mean, that, that keeps the cosmos in its order that, that exists? Jesus. So, I mean, if you think about it, if you remove Jesus, what happens? All atomic structure, etc. all atoms, everything goes psycho. Why? He's the one that holds it together by his, his extreme power as God. So if he is that powerful, he is that providential. Now, it says in the scriptures, if you read the book of Job, uh, that he controls things like snow. Praise God. <laughs> so the next time it snows, which I put my snowblower away this weekend, hallelujah, um, because it's over, is it not? Well, <laughs> I'm not from here, but I'm hoping. But, but I read this week, Psalm, uh, Job 37, verses 6 to 13, says that, G, that God controls the snow on the earth. He causes it. So the next time it happens to you, just go outside, say, praise God for this. Uh, lightning strikes, uh, Job 37, verses 6 to 13, says he brings all lightning strikes. They're not arbitrary. Um, he controls the movement of nations, all the movements of nations, Psalm 22, verse 28. Uh, and then it says in Proverbs 16, 33, which is really good when you study the book of Job, he controls the role of all dice. Did you ever grow up playing? I, I grew up playing board games with my sister Marla uh, and you know, we, rolling dice. All those times that she beat me while she's multitasking, it was providential. Because <laughs> Psalms, uh, Proverbs 6, 30, 16, 33 says that he controls the role of the dice, the doubles, the whatever. He's that providential. If he's that providential, then he must really care about all the things in your life. Because in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which is what we've been talking about, it says, and you should have it memorized, should you not, that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. He has a purpose for your life. He's going to fulfill those purposes because he's providential. He's omniscient. He's all powerful. He can make it happen. And he's all good. So in all the good and the bad of your life, he's weaving like a weaver all the different threads to pr produce a beautiful tapestry that I think one day in heaven, you'll see the wonder of what he was doing. But sometimes he gives you a glimpse here. So in light of all that, it leads to the premise that we've been talking about for weeks from chapter 8, verse eight, uh, 18 and following, that believers should stay hopeful in, in, in the fight against the flesh. Why? God's providential. Remember, he promised to never leave you or forsake you, and indeed he shall not. Now, we tend to forget about his providence when things, when bad things happen, like my stove blew up. Remember I told you about that? You're new this week? But I got a new one, you know? So I got that Shabbat stove. It's working great. Liz is loving it. It's unbelievable. It's, it's got that little kosher signal on it in the, in the glass. It's, it's been awesome all week. She has cooked cookies, muffins. The staff has loved this week because it's a convection oven. She could cook two things at one time. She's in total bliss. So I would, just, man, just blow your stove up, buy your wife a new one. So, but it's all providential. God controls even that. So your car breaks down. What do you say? Praise God. He's got a plan in this. I'm buying a new one. You know, I mean, like whatever. Now, why should you stay helpful in the fight of the flesh to be serious? Well, we've given you multiple reasons from Paul's pen, Romans chapter eight. Uh, I've given you four reasons to be exact. The, there they are just to review. You should know them. They should be burned in memory banks. Why you should be helpful. It's because all those things. Last week, we added reason number five. You should be helpful as you fight the world, the flesh, the devil. It's because providence, divine providence provides, always provides positive provision for you. Always. God's always working towards your good. Remember what was the verse again? All things work together for good to those who love God and are according, called according to his purpose. So we defined terms last week by way of review. Um, you re review is a wonderful thing. Why? Brain cells die daily. I'm just trying to encourage you. So um, we need to remember the definition of providence means, quote, uh, Dr. Charles Ryrie, who taught uh, systematic theology at Dallas Seminary, where I attended years ago. Uh, here's what he says about divine providence. He says, uh, regarding providence, uh, ultimately, God is in control of all things, though he may choose to let certain events happen according to natural laws, which he has ordained, but he's in control of even those. You fall off the skis when you're water skiing, who's in control of that? God. Uh, you, uh, you lose a ski snow skiing. God's in control of that. He's in control of all these things. No, none of this takes him by, by uh, surprise. He's, his providence and his sovereignty is, is, is massive. Secondly, we talked about a distorted view of providence, which was Rabbi Kushner, uh, and it's called finite godism. 
And find out God doesn't basically says, uh, yes, I believe in God, but I don't believe he's in, uh, totally in control of the entire cosmos. That things uh, happen he's not aware of and they get by him. And we talked about that last week about how that's an erroneous view of God because if God is not in control of all things and knows all things, he ipso facto is not God. Uh, and that's not the God of the Old Testament anyway. And if you want to read my notes uh, online tomorrow, I give you uh, eight more distorted views of the providence of God if you really want to get into it with your small group. It's in the footnotes. But today we want to talk about uh, uh, the display of providence. We've talked about the definition of providence, the distortion of providence. Today we want to talk about the display of it. And to, to understand the display of providence, that all things do work together for good, it helps to remember, well, how do we know that from the Old Testament? Because those are examples there for us to learn from. So I wrote down more than I could speak about in one Sunday, but two concepts which validate that God is providential in your life. One of them is this. Here's the first premise. Divine providence is displayed in a timeless truth that seemingly meaningless events of your life, they're highly meaningful. Because there can't be any such thing as chance. Why can't there be chance? Well, because God's providential. If he controls the dice and, and you, the ball when you hit it, when you're playing golf, all these things, I mean, if he's providential to that, to that point, there could, by definition, be no chance. And so when you think about that, that all the seemingly meaningless events of your life that are mundane, sometimes tragic, uh, they're highly meaningful because he's working in them. Uh, one of the greatest books that validates that premise is the book of Ruth. It's four short chapters. How many actually know the book of Ruth? It saved me a ton of time. Excellent. How many don't know anything about the book of Ruth? Okay, it's excellent. Okay, all right. That's why you're in church. Because we're going to talk about Ruth. So you could go home and read the book. It's four chapters. It's easy read. Uh, but uh, her story illustrates, um, well, what providence is all about. And you don't see the, the divine name really woven throughout the book in, in a great fashion. Because he's showing you, I'm the primary cause of the things that happened to Ruth and Naomi. Uh, but but uh, don't, don't forget that I, my hand is in all of these things. So uh, kind of like to review the story for the people that haven't uh, had any familiarity with it for whatever reasons. Uh, there was a, a lady named Naomi who has a husband named Elimelech. They're from the city of Bethlehem. There's a famine hits the land. There's no food. The only thing they can do is move to what is now modern day Jordan or Moab. Uh, they're enemies. Uh, they move there to find food for their family. They have two sons. The two sons are there uh, with them. They move with them. And while they're there, the dad dies, and then the two sons get married to two Moabite girls, contrary to Mosaic law. And then they die, leaving Naomi the mother and two daughter-in-laws that are Moabite women. The sons sinned when they married those two women. So it's basically the story. You have this Jewish lady in the wrong country at the wrong time. She's now no husband, no sons, and she's got two Moabite daughter-in-laws. Wow. So I have a number of questions in light of that little story. I have about 12 questions, okay? And these are just the rhetorical questions. You don't have to respond to this as I usually ask you to, okay? So just be quiet at this point. Okay. Because <laughs> I can just see somebody going, oh, yeah, it's my turn to talk. Okay. Was it just peculiar coincidence that Naomi's husband, Elimelech, uh, came from the little village of Bethlehem and happened to be from the tribe of Judah? Is that coincidental? Because uh, I know someone else that's going to come from Bethlehem in the tribe of Judah of a bigger order. His name? Now you can talk. Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. Uh, Beit, Beit Lechem, house of bread. Jesus, the bread of life. The Messiah is going to come from there. And we know that from uh, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. We prophesied 800 years before his birth that he'd come from there and from that tribe. Was that by accident? No. It was the severe famine which drove that couple and their two sons to live in the land of their enemies. Uh, was that just a bad turn of cosmic events? Mm, no. Uh, where was God when Naomi's husband died shortly after they arrived in the land of their enemies? I mean, where was he? He, he, was, he was there with her. He had not deserted her. Uh, what were her two sons thinking when they married two women from Moab when Deuteronomy 7 said explicitly, don't do that. They will take your, your heart away from serving God. Don't do that. Uh, and if you sin, does your sin trump the providence of God? Uh, was it a stroke of bad fortune when the two sons of Naomi, a Jew, died, leaving their mother alone? Was that just a bad turn of events? Was it just complete, a complete fluke that Ruth the Moabitess, the only daughter-in-law uh, that really wanted to go back to Israel with her mother-in-law? Was that just, I mean, why didn't they both go back? 
Why did only Ruth go back? Uh, was it uh, simply good fortune that when they returned to Bethlehem, it, it happened to be at the beginning of the barley harvest? Uh, was it by chance that Ruth wound up harvesting in the field of Boaz, a wealthy farmer and a, member, uh, a family member? He was a, uh, related to Elimelech. Uh, really, she could have gleaned as a poor person in anybody's field. There wasn't just one. She just happened to wind up in the field of a family member, Boaz? That was by accident? Do you think it was simply good luck that uh, Boaz, riding on his horse, happened to see this Moabitess out of all the poor women gleaning after the harvesters gleaned the field and their stubble left? And the poor people, the women, are crouched down gathering the stubble for food. Had he not seen a lot of these women do this before? And was it just by chance he saw one that he thought, wow, she's good looking? <laughs> I mean, was it by chance? Was it Ruth's just lucky day that she ran into a, a, a man of Boaz's stature and she married him? Wow. Well, it wasn't by accident. Well, how do I know that? Well, you've got to read chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 13, tells you it wasn't by accident. Here's what we read. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. And then the, the women said to Naomi, her mother-in-law, quote, Blessed is the Lord, you know that Baruch Adonai thing, uh, who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. That's an understatement. It says, may he also be to you a restorer of the life and the sustainer of your old age. Remember, you lost your husband, you lost your two sons, but God has restored your life to you. Uh, for your daughter-in-law, uh, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name saying, quote, a son has been, given, uh, has been born to Naomi, unquote. So they named this child Obed. Just by accident. Uh, he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. David. Who's David? The king of Israel. Isn't it amazing? God took a Jew and a Gentile, even though the law was broken, and took the sin and made it something awesome. That's the greatness of God. So now the, it says, now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born. And this is stuff when you're reading the Old Testament, you're thinking, so boring. It's genealogical stuff. No, it's not boring. It's exciting. Uh, he is Perez. Perez was born, was born, to him was born Hezron. To Hezron was born Ram. To Ram, Abinadab. To Abinadab was born Nashon. To Nashon was born Salmon. Uh, and to Salmon was born Boaz. And to Boaz was born Obed. And to Obed was born Jesse. And to Jesse was born David, David, the king. Yeah. See how God took that mess of a life? Lost my husband, lost my two sons, stuck with a Moabitess, a result of a sinful marriage, etc. And God said, I can take this goy, this goyim, and I can transform this whole thing. Because from David, when you read Matthew chapter 1, from David comes Jesus, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, as prophesied. From what city? Bethlehem. From what tribe? Judah. As prophesied. Genesis 49, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. What's this tell you about your life? Amen. What's it tell you? You got any things that's messed up? Bad decisions, sinful things? What? God looks down from heaven and goes, oh, it's totally caught me off guard what you just did there. <laughs> no, no, God says, no, I can, I can do that. I can fix that. I can fix that. I, I got my hand on that. I, I don't know. That's the kind of God that I serve that I'm excited about. That, like, when I shared that my stove blew up last week, when I finished my sermon on the providence of God, it was kind of comical. Because I'm like, okay, God, I guess you're going to show yourself great. And he did. It, but in a kind of a funny way. I mean, this is the humor of God. Um, God is, God's ways are down to the smallest events of your life to accomplish his purposes, to take the loose threads of all the tragic things, loss of a husband, loss of two sons, etc., and bring through your line the Messiah. Unbelievable. So were all the events meaningless? Well, they seem to be. But God says, no, they're highly meaningful because from your line and all your family dysfunction, I'm going to bring the Messiah to bless the world. Amen. You trust that, God? Yes. I've told you this before, but a restatement is excellent, is it not? How did I meet my wife? Do you remember? No, not around the piano. Well, we eventually got around a piano. 
It's always good to be around the piano. Yeah, that, that came later. Uh, I'll just recap, like, kind of how I met my wife, because it's kind of like Boaz. Um, I'm in college in L.A., Zeus Pacific University. My dad moves to San Diego from El Centro, the desert near Yuma to El Centro, from, to, to San Diego to be the uh, district director, U.S. Customs, out of the federal building downtown San Diego. He moves to Poway. I don't even know where Poway is. He moves to Poway. He calls me one day. Hey, son, you need to come home. There's some really pretty twins next door. <laughs> Do you let your dad pick your dates? <laughs> I didn't. And then I told my dad the statistical averages at my university were five girls to every guy. Why would I want to come home? <laughs> he said, I'm, I'm serious. You need to come home. Because as my dad was trying to sell his house in El Centro, my mom was left there. My dad's in San Diego, two hours away. Uh, next door neighbors were Liz and Mary Beth, two twins. Liz felt sorry for Al Baker next door. So she started bringing him cookies. He loves cookies. He said, she's so sweet, she's so nice, etc. cetera. I uh, always stayed the summers in L.A. and sold boats for my roommate's dad, Marsha Marine, largest boat dealership in L.A. at the time. But then there was a gas crisis that summer. Wasn't a good time to sell boats. So guess where I went? I went home to Poway and became a gardener at a huge complex. And I met my wife, and we started dating. But she wasn't a Christian. I didn't date non-Christian girls. I never did. And God sent me one. I began to share Christ with her. She was dating a weightlifter that looked like Schwarzenegger <laughs> and drove a Porsche. I shared Christ with her. One day, I met with her on the porch when we were talking, and she said, uh, I did what you told me to do last night. I like, go, what do you mean? She goes, I trusted Christ. Led her to Christ. That was a good convert. Find him, share Christ with him, and then propose. That's what I did. <laughs> providential that my dad moved there? I was dating Laura for four years. Four years. I grew up with Laura. I was going to marry Laura. I knew her family. Dad was a Marine vet, World War II. I mean, I knew this family. Went to church with them. I wasn't going to, I wasn't even interested in Liz. I was just sharing Christ with her. And then Laura called me up and broke up with me. <laughs> and then Mike, the weightlifter, broke up with Liz. And there we were single next door to each other. Gas crisis. Couldn't afford to go anywhere. It was just perfect. <laughs> meaningless events. They're not meaningless. They're not. God's at work, is he not, to do great things, Amen. to bless you, trust him. And then I'll close you with this last little tidbit. This is a great story, worth a ton of time, but I'll just introduce it to you. Second concept is uh, divine providence is displayed in the timeless truth that sinful injustice is turned to sacred justice in due time. Our world's full of injustice. Does God look at that and go, oh, it's so terrible. There's nothing I can do about it. No. God looks at injustice and says, no, I'm working. Just trust me. In this tragedy, I'm at work. And you think about our week, how tragic our week has been. But God's saying what? Still at work. And, and prayer is powerful. So he's, he's still powerful. How do I know all this? Well, there's a young man in the Old Testament. His name is Joseph. And Joseph uh, had some brothers with issues. <laughs> Because when you read Genesis 37, God gives uh, Joseph two dreams. Both dreams tell him and his other siblings. How many brothers did he have? He had 11 brothers and he had one sister, Dinah. Remember her? Um, it, and these, 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 uh, these visions elevate him and God tells him, you're going to be the greatest of all your brothers. And he told them. <laughs> okay, how'd that go over? what they want to do? Kill him. Kill him. I mean, I don't know how you felt about your siblings. You probably had times when you wanted to just like, like, I didn't say anything yet. <laughs> well, like, just do something to him. You know, it's like they're driving me crazy. Uh, they wanted to get rid of him. And so one day he headed to the city of Dothan, uh, which was just north of Samaria, the capital. Uh, and they see him coming with the coat of many colors that their dad had given him to show his greatness of the family. They couldn't stand him. They have a huge debate, discussion on what do we throw him in a pit, leave him for dead? Like, what do we do? Uh, what? What did they end up doing? They sold their brother. You ever feel like doing this to a sibling? <laughs> yeah, you're worth about 25 bucks. No. <laughs> they sold him to some Ishmaelites who then sold him to... Well, they took him to Egypt. He doesn't speak the language. He doesn't read hieroglyphics. They take this young man down to Egypt. They sell him to a guy named Potiphar. Potiphar happened to be the head executioner for Pharaoh. That's a great place to go. Man, if I mess up in this house, it's over for me. 
Potiphar has a wife who has issues, does she not? She is a predator. Is she not? She sees him and eventually, well, what if, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm getting too excited. Uh, Genesis chapter 39 tells you the story about his situation, being sold into slavery. And it says in Genesis 39, verses 3 to 6, that while he's there in Potiphar's house, God was with him and blessed him even there. Isn't that amazing? And then she propositions him one night because he's a good looking young guy. What's he do? He ran for his life left some of his clothing in her hand. She then tells her husband, the head executioner, this guy propositioned me. That was a lie. He then says, how dare he throws him in prison, does he not? He doesn't, listen to the, he doesn't listen for the evidence. He throws him in prison. And while he's there, he doesn't question God. And while he's there, and it tells us in Genesis chapter 40, that even in the prison, God's with him. And he doesn't question God. And while he's there, he runs into two individuals, a butler and a baker. Who's the butler? He's the head guy that tastes all the food before Pharaoh eats it. I wonder why he's in prison. Maybe there was a burger or something that came along. He's like, I'm not eating that. Whatever. He winds up in prison. Then he's the butler. Then there's the baker. He's the guy cooking the food for the Pharaoh. Why'd he wind up in prison? Might've made something they thought something was in, you know, some poison or something. They're both in prison. While they're there, they both have dreams and they can't interpret the dreams, but there's Joseph who has the divine gift to interpret dreams. He interprets both their dreams. What's he tell the butler? Well, he tells the butler in chapter 40, verses 8 to 15, you're going to get out of jail and be the butler again of, of Pharaoh. What's he tell the baker? In three days, you're going to lose your head. Oh, well, that was positive. Well, what happened? Both those things happened. The Pharaoh released the butler and reinstated him to his high position as his head food taster. And three days later, they executed the baker. Uh, Joseph merely just had one little statement for, the, uh, for the, the butler. He said, when you get released, make sure you tell Pharaoh that I'm in here on trumped up charges. Don't forget me. Did he forget him? Yeah, he forgot him. He forgot him for two years. Two long years. Two long years, Joseph did not ever grow bitter and angry at the sovereignty of God, wasting away his life in Egypt. Eventually, a famine hits the land, uh, and when the famine hits the land, uh, there's a whole scenario that involves with Pharaoh. Pharaoh has a dream. It's bad. It's about a famine. He doesn't understand it. He tells the butler, I, I got to have somebody interpret the dream. Two years later, the butler says, I know a guy from prison. His name's Joseph. They go and get him. He interprets the dream, tells the Pharaoh, so the famine's coming. You better prepare, store food before the famine. Famine comes and Joseph is elevated to the number two man in the nation, other than the Pharaoh. See, God took him from the pit to the pinnacle. He worked through all the tragedies of his life to bless him greatly, and he never questioned God. And the same famine that hit Israel, uh, hit uh, Egypt, hit Israel, forced his brothers to come down there for food because they had stored it. Well, what's interesting is chapter 45, verse 4, when his brothers have to come before this Egyptian official for food. It says in verse four, then Joseph said to his brothers who didn't recognize him, he knew who they were, please come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold in Egypt. Let's just stop right there. If you're one of them, what are you thinking? It's over. Uh, and now don't be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here for God sent me before you to preserve life. What a mindset. Sold into slavery, just, I mean, you name it. They took his coat of many colors, killed an animal, put blood all over it, told their daddy he'd been eaten alive by an animal. I mean, all the stuff that had thrown and chumped up charges that weren't true, languished away in a, a dark prison, etc. But God said, I'm going to make you number two in Israel, and then, or number two in Egypt, but I'm going to make sure that you're down here in Egypt years later when a famine strikes so you can provide food for your family. It's shocking. God sent me here. Uh, later, he, they go get the rest of the family. They bring dad down there. And their dad's there with them for 17 years of extreme joy. It's amazing. But then dad died. And then there's chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their dad had died, they said to themselves, this is amazing. What if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and play, pay us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? Dad's dead. It, we're toast. That's my translation of that Hebrew. 
verse 16. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, quote, your father charged before he died saying, thus shall you say to Joseph, please forgive. This is it's kind of funny. Please, please forgive. I beg you the transgression of your brothers and the, their sin for they did you wrong. <laughs> and he now uh, and, and now please forgive the transgression of the servants of, of the God of your father. And when he heard that, it says he wept. He broke down and cried. He had no intention on getting rid of his brothers. He loved them. Verse 18, then his brothers came and fell down before him and they said to him, quote, behold, we are your servants. Are you kidding? Just as prophesied in his earlier dreams as a young man. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid for, uh, for am I God in this place? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Why? In order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. There's no greater statements in the Old Testament that through extreme family difficulties, God said to Joseph, I sent you there to care for your family, basically to be Christ to them. See, God takes injustices and turns them into justice. That's his business. Along those lines, I want to introduce you as we leave to uh, a young lady. Her name is Jess. She has a little uh, baby daughter. Uh, but when she got pregnant, she wasn't going to have that baby. She was going to abort that baby. Uh, she was a Fresno State student in California. And there was a professor on campus uh, who told his students, because he was pro-choice, he was going to go and, and take all the chalk messages of all of the, the Christian students who were pro-life and erase them all with their shoes. So they did. And the Christian students filmed the professor and his students as they did that. Uh, Alliance Defending Freedom then came and took this injustice because they have First Amendment rights as well. And it went to court and they won. Uh, and the professor who was mean-spirited was disciplined, financially speaking. And then the students were given the right to put their signage pro-life anywhere they wanted on campus as often as they wanted. And one day that young lady there who was going to get rid of her unborn child saw the messages and changed her mind and had, had that little baby. See, what was an injustice of a professor? God looked down from heaven and said, I'll take that injustice and I'll do something awesome with it. I'll bring a life to the planet. No telling what that little girl is going to do. See, this is the way God operates. You believe his sovereignty goes down to that level? I do. He takes injustice and turns it to justice. It's his business. Trust him, and he'll bless you greatly. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your greatness, that if we pay attention, uh, we can learn much about how your, your providence intersects with our lives. You are, you are concerned about two soldiers passing in the middle of the night in a war zone. You, you're concerned about uh, injustices done uh, to us in the workplace, in marriages, etc. All of these things, uh, you're working a plan to bless us greatly. For that, we ask for an increase of our trust in your providence. And may we uh, be full of great hope as we deal with our flesh and the sin and the devil that we encounter daily. And may we have great hope of what lies ahead because of your providence. In Christ's name, amen.